All right, guys, hanging out in the aviary again, and uh, this is day three of the Straw Bale Garden project and Straw Bale Garden inoculation and fertilizing uh, to get them charged up. And you notice things look a little different. That's because, you know, I wanted to get this done. So uh, when the uh, the inoculant showed up, I just got the bales out here and followed the directions that came with the inoculant. I hadn't actually read the man's book yet. And a couple of y'all said, hey, stupid, guess what? You're doing it wrong. Uh, I'm not doing it wrong. How you do it wrong? You got the bales wrong, dummy. It's not supposed to be sitting with the wires up. It's supposed to be on end. And uh, to tell you the truth, it looked to me when I looked at other people doing it that they were doing it the way I had it, which is with the, the flat side of the bale. I think it's all the sides are flat, you know, the, the face of the bale up. Uh, so I just did that. But when I put them in, and I was thinking about planting out toward the edges, the edges of these bales, when you're on the wire side or the line side of the bale, there's not a lot of structural integrity that way. There's a lot more this way. And the reason that they say to do this is because you can see you got the ends of the straw here. You see how it opens up, kind of like an end grain cutting board and if it was under a microscope. So when your knife comes through, the ends split out. And that lets the... Uh, inoculant get in there a lot better apparently uh, but I think it'll also be a lot more structurally sound for plants to be able to stand up with the roots again especially toward the end now the bigger difference you guys remember the first video straw bales came all the way to here well they're a little bit more narrow this way than they are that way so when I stood them up yesterday I looked at them and said I think I can fit three in one section turns out I can so now I've got my six bales taking up a lot less space. And you guys know me with uh, planting density. I'm, I'm pretty insane when it comes to planting density because, well, it works. So uh, this, this is interesting now. So the bucket of uh, inoculant that I bought is uh, for five bales. And you can do a lot more bales if you buy the non-organic version from them. Uh, that uses conventional fertilizer because apparently the conventional fertilizer goes further and works faster but i don't do conventional fertilizer i do all organic so i have no problem stretching the five bale buster to six just by pitching some chicken uh, blood meal into the boxes it lowers down uh, to make it work it's not a big deal and he says blood meal in his book i've been reading the book now and one thing you need to understand about his uh his product, his Bale Buster product, he kind of was reluctantly drug into it. People just wanted it. He says in his books over and over again that you can use basically any high nitrogen organic fertilizer or conventional fertilizer and tells you exactly what to do. And uh, some people were asking me, well, how sustainable is this? Um, infinitely. Let me explain to you why. Whether you and I like conventional agriculture or not, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. This is a waste product of conventional agriculture. This is either oats or barley or straw or wheat stalks. So they harvest that little bit of grain off the top and the rest of this is a waste product. It exists. They are not making it for, for people to do gardens in. It exists. The people put it out all the time. The same people say it's not sustainable are using it for their chickens to shit in and their horses to shit in, etc. All right? And they're using it to make compost. So the straw, you know, the, the, the problem now is finding it without paying too much for it to make it financially unsustainable, but ecologically, this stuff exists. Number two, I am kind of surprised at how much fertilization these things need, but I've, if I've been reading the books right, the reason for that is to not have a delayed gratification. You could use very little amount of fertilizer, and if you're willing to wait a month, month and a half for these things to be ready to plant into, you don't have to use anywhere near as much. Next, every single one of you, every single one of you has the ability to make your own fertilizer from this in the form of, yeah, you guessed it, pea. Your pea is very, very high in nitrogen and simply saving and dumping your urine. So if you want to be infinitely sustainable, you can literally pee on your garden until it's ready to go. And it won't smell any worse than any other form of compost, I promise you. If you think about it, it's not much different than a sawdust toilet, the way that it works. So if you wanted to go 100% natural, you could do that. Uh, he says not to use manures and stuff like that because it attracts critters, and I get that. Uh, my idea now, 
and I hate paying as much as my feed store is charging me for these things, but I called them and talked to them about it, and they're good people. And they said that they have a shortage right now of straw. So when they have a shortage, they jack prices up. That's the market. So I understand. And I probably could work to find it cheaper, but again, I'm going on vacation in about two weeks. Maybe three now. I just wish it was tomorrow. Uh, but I got enough for six more bales to go right here. So what I'm thinking is about running down this afternoon, getting six more bales, and doing the trial here, basically his product, and now he says to do it without his product, with a little bit of an adjunct. adjunct. Uh, I use a, a fertilizer called uh, Dr. Earth uh, Fertilizer, and I wouldn't use it exclusively because it's too expensive, but it has a lot of beneficial bacteria and fungi, more than's in his product. So what I'm thinking about doing is just getting really, really cheap blood meal, which is basically what he's got in his product. It's, it's pork blood meal and inoculating these next six, and they'll be a little bit, a couple, you know, three days behind these guys, but inoculating these six with that blood meal, the really cheap blood meal, and then using the Dr. Earth in very small quantities to add the additional beneficial bacteria and fungi and trialing them side by side. Now, I don't mind doing that because basically it's what he says to do. Now, some of y'all said when I said, because I, I commented on my blog and in the video, when y'all told me I had to, the bale's wrong, and really nobody said you're a big dummy or stupid or anything. I'm, I'm kidding. I try to get you guys to laugh once in a while, but when I, when I said, well, I'll fix it and I'll talk about it next video. Some of y'all said, well, why don't you leave them this way and the other way, split them in half, and trial them side by side. I'm all about trialing things side by side, unless a man has done it for 30 years. When a man's done something for 30 years and he tells you to do it a certain way, then you should do it that way, if nothing else, first, because he probably has tried. Your idea on that. I want to go more on the sustainability of this. Um, as I'm reading his book, he gives instructions to build a, a compressor, basically to make your own bales out of anything from lawn clippings to, to leaves. So you could drive around suburbia in the in the fall and early spring and just pick up yuppies bags of leaves because they always want to get rid of those nasty leaves, don't they? Make your own bales, pee on them, and do this for free. So... You either do fast and easy, or you do a little bit more work and you can do free. So I do think this is very, very sustainable here. Another thing people said is, oh, you know it's gonna happen now? You know it's gonna happen now? All your plants are gonna die. Well, why are my plants gonna die? Because there's agricultural herbicide waste. In it. Okay, there's a half a million people doing this. There's a Facebook group bigger than just about anything I've ever seen on the subject of gardening and agriculture. There's literally thousands and thousands of pictures of plants blowing through the roof, coming out of these bales. And I just think that we have overplayed and overblamed this concept of residual herbicide causing problems in our gardens. Every time there's a problem, doesn't matter what it is, every time there's a problem, it's residual herbicides. When I started bringing wood mulch in, bulk wood mulch and bulk compost, from a local facility, I had the same horror stories. Oh, it's going to have residual herbicide. Does that look like it has residual herbicide in it? Does that look like it's any way impacted? You see this? This is a bean. If you want to know who the canary in the coal mine is with residual herbicide, it is a bean. All legumes. If you want to test a source, plant beans in it. Because if beans grow in it, you do not have a residual herbicide problem. If anything's going to knock something down, you know, that's what it is. Again, do I look... Like I'm suffering from residual herbicide problems. I, I I don't even know how that friggin' chard plant's growing back in there in all that shade, but it is, isn't it? I mean, does this look like residual herbicide problems to you? And I'm gonna tell you where all this crap started. And don't take this wrong, because he's a dear friend. I've backed every Kickstarter he's ever had, both by promoting it and with my own money. He's on my expert council for my podcast. Uh, he kind of bends people in the wrong direction. Some people really hate him. I love him as a guy that, you know what, some people are going to hate. But he has caused this crap, and his name is Paul Wheaton, and he's the one that has spread this myth near and far, and then all of a sudden, what's based on a kernel of truth, certain things from certain sources can have some residual herbicides that can cause a problem, has become every single person... It has a plant that grows in a funky way or somewhere they don't want to, they did something wrong, gets blamed on that. Manure did it. It's, it's a, and I'm going to tell you right now, I've been using this straw from this source 
for six years I've been on this little farm and generally what happens with it is I put it in my chicken house the chickens use it until it, and the ducks use it until it starts to get to where it needs to go I throw it in a pile I compost and I use a compost to grow that so I think it's time that we all kind of started to understand that maybe things aren't a simple on off switch and not everything that's not the way we do things is the enemy the other thing you need to understand what you're doing here is I'm picking this up real quick and I already had this before I read his book when I when I had the man on my uh, Joel on my show for the interview you are not growing in straw in a straw bale garden I know that seems completely ridiculous but you're not you're growing in young compost the whole reason we're doing this process for 18 days with an organic fertilizer getting the temperature up and getting everything the way it needs to be before we plant into it is so that the straw begins to break down on the inside when you go into the composting process what you're doing is you're taking nitrogen and carbon and they're binding up together most of the things that we worry about and you can ask Jeff Lawton about this and as much as I love Paul I trust Jeff more when you take things that have some residual herbicides and stuff like that in them and you put them through a composting process they bind up with the carbon chains and they become inert additionally i'll tell you what kills specifically glyphosate roundup is uv exposure bright light and heat okay well that temperature inside that bale is going to get up to 140 150 degrees so i think we're overplaying this then the other thing is this is going to be a grain product other than rice and this is not rice straw we don't have gmo wheat we don't have gmo barley okay we don't have that we don't have gmo oats it doesn't exist so you can't spray the crop here come the planes f-35s come on guys get on out of here trying to teach down here leave me alone it's a conspiracy no all right i thought that was really cool when i moved in i got over in about a week all right so Come on, guys, get out of here. So we don't have GMO, barley, wheat, etc. Which means you can't spray glyphosate on these, on these crops while they're growing. Now, there is a story going around, and it is based on some fact that some people will spray wheat and other grains with a little bit of uh, Roundup right before harvest to dry them out. It is done. It is not done to the level that people claim. It's an additional expense and it's an additional step. Farmers are pretty good at business. That's why they're now selling freaking straw bales for five to ten dollars a bale when they used to be two bucks. Farmers are entrepreneurial and they're not going to spend money and, and spend labor, which is money, if they don't have to. So that is only done, and I bought into it, guys, I did, but it is only done where necessary for that person to salvage a crop. So is it possible? It is, but why would you spray a crop a week before you're going to harvest it otherwise and the answer is you wouldn't because it doesn't make any dad gone sense i've seen people use straw for years and years and years please stop worrying that everything's got icky geek on it's going to hurt you and with all due respect to paul sometimes you need to think for your damn self and stop believing everything one person says you don't even have to believe what i say but you do have to believe a half a million people doing this and it's working so uh we'll see how it turns out and i'm not guaranteeing it's going to do real good here Remember what I said, I don't know how this is gonna turn out. I just wanna give it a shot, see how it works. And it gives me a way to use this space that otherwise wouldn't get used this season. So, because that way I couldn't, I'll go, I think I'm gonna do that. I think I've convinced myself. I'm gonna go get six more bales, bite the bullet on the cost just to get it done before I get out of here, get the inoculation going on them. And I've still got, you know, three more of these wicking beds that I can get in this season and really a fourth down there if I wanted to. And that's probably more than I'm going to do anyway. And uh, we'll just keep enjoying the harvest, guys. If you guys have any questions about what I'm doing, and don't let me yelling at you over the residual herbicide thing turn you off. Uh, if you got any questions about what I'm doing, what's going on here, how any of this works, uh, or what the future plans are, let me know in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them in the next video.